Hey guys, my name is Katie Moreno and I am the founder of OrganizeAdvisor.com and in this session I'm going to talk to you about the basics of creating a yearbook page layout. The anatomy of it, the terminology, um, how we create a page from the very, very basic concept all the way through completion. Um, and then at the end we'll talk about a little checklist that you can download to really make sure that you caught everything when you start designing your page. So, let's get started. First. First, it would be helpful if I knew how to use my computer. <laughs> um, first, um, you're gonna notice that when you start designing a layout, a lot of times schools will design their layouts in what we call columns. And so this is up to you, however many columns you wanna use. Most schools use anywhere between four and eight. Sometimes the schools will put 16 on each page. Um, and this gives your layout a little bit of a base to start with. And so you start designing with elements like the story, the photos, the captions, they start and stop on one of these grid lines. And that just gives your, yourself a little bit of structure to get started with, but don't feel like you have to use these grid lines. Sometimes you can just use measurements, but for our purposes today, because we wanna learn the basics, and then once we know the rules, we can break the rules, um, we're gonna use a basic layout of just four columns on each page. Now, notice I said on each page, and you might be looking at this and be like, but there's eight, what do you mean? This is a page, right? No, it's actually called a spread. It's a two-page spread when it's when the yearbook is opened like this, and it is it consists of the, the each page on each uh, on the left and right side. But when it's put together, it's a spread, and we always want to design spreads cohesively so they look like one cohesive unit and not two separate pages. Now, sometimes yearbooks, depending on the amount of space that you have and the amount of stuff you have to cover, I totally understand that some schools have to cover like one thing on one side and one thing on the other side, that's totally fine. That's not really what I what I mean. I mean if you're doing one spread about one topic, you should have some sort of element that crosses over the middle that brings the two sides together. So a picture or a graphic element of some kind, like a colored box, or you have a timeline that goes all the way across the spread, something on that page brings the two sides together. Now notice I mentioned the middle of the page. That also has a special name in graphic design and book production, and that's what we call the gutter. We wanna be careful with that gutter right in the middle, that like bigger white space in the middle, because whenever we they print yearbooks and they sew the pages together and they bind them all, there is a little bit of uh, paper that gets stuck in there, and if you put words or someone's face, there's a chance that during production, it can get kind of sucked up into that fold. So you wanna be really careful with what you put in that gutter, and if it's something that it could be, uh, if it's off a little bit, it could look a little weird, like text, you don't want that in that gutter. So typically we say no text over the middle, and pictures are fine, but the way you crop them has to make sure that the person's face isn't right in the middle. So the first thing that you want to put on your spread, again, if I knew how to use my computer, um, is a line that goes all the way across from left to right that is actually just gonna be a guide. This is actually going to be invisible. It's gonna be white space on your spread. But for our purposes right now, we're just gonna mark it. Um, this is gonna be called your eye line. And this is quite literally where we want our reader's eye to go when they open the book. And so this serves as an anchor point for all your objects on the page to either sit on top of or hang down from below. And we want this to be in that middle third of your spread because we want to make sure that there's room for elements to be either underneath it or above it. And if it was too high, it would, all the elements would be really tiny at the top. And if it was too low, all the elements would be really low at the bottom, really tiny at the bottom. And so we wanna make sure it's in that middle third but also not right quite in the middle. Like we don't wanna just divide our spread up into quadrants. That wouldn't be visually interesting for our eyes to look at. We want something that will allow us to use one of the quadrants being quite a bit larger than the rest because that is where our dominant element and dominant photo is gonna go. After that, the second thing we're gonna put on the page is literally the exact same and for the exact same reason, but vertically instead of horizontally. So this is uh, the vertical anchor, and this is called our eye, um, I'm sorry, our axis. And so the axis is serves the exact same purpose as the eye line. It serves as our anchor, and that's going to be our kind of our focal point of the spread. This is where our eye is automatically going to go because we're going to design from the center out, and we're going to start to put content. And then so the, our eye is going to be drawn to that middle, and then 
circle around and get all the rest of the content afterward, which is what we want. We want to control our readers' um, attention as they open the spread and look at it. So the first thing you're actually going to put on the spread, remember these are invisible. These are just marking where they're going. There's are, these are elements on your spread that aren't going to be crossed over. They're not going to be filled up. They're not going to have anything there. It's going to be white space. Um, but the first thing you're actually going to place on your spread is going to be a photo. It's going to be your biggest photo, dominant. Um, it's going to be called your dominant photo, and it's going to be two to three times bigger than everything else. You want it to be very visually obvious and clear that this is the dominant photo. It should be way bigger than everything else. Most yearbooks that I see that are just getting started or, um, you know, they, they are just new, new to designing your books, I mean, um, they're lacking that dominant photo. And that's one of the easiest things that you can do. Take one element on your page and make it giant. Also, a lot of times that can also apply to your headline. Usually your headline is too small as well. But anyways, we'll get to headlines in a second. So you have your dominant photo. It's two to three times bigger than the rest. Notice it also goes over that gutter. It goes over the middle and it takes up three columns. And so if you if you look at the gray columns that you can imagine kind of behind there, it, it starts at the edge of that third column and goes all the way to the other edge of that fifth column. And you want it to take up that whole space. You don't want to just randomly throw on a box and make it whatever size you want. You want it to go all the way on the bottom to the eye line, all the way on the right to that um, axis, all the way on the top to the top of that margin area where the that white space is, um, and to the top of that column, and then all the way on the left to the edge of the column. You don't want it to start or stop in the middle of a column. Then you want to add space for a story. It doesn't have to be three columns wide like a traditional story would be. It can be one column, it can be alternative coverage, it doesn't have to be like a traditional feature story, but we just want to leave the space for it at this point. Remember, we can break the rules once we know the rules, and so this is one of those areas where we want to leave space for a headline, leave space for a subhead, and then leave space for our body copy, but just know that this is just a placeholder. Our body copy it itself can be whatever you want it to be. There's a lot of alternative ways to tell stories these days. It doesn't have to be this big, long story. In fact, Three columns worth of a big long story is quite long, so we probably would shorten that. But for right now, we're gonna leave it as three. So these are our, um, our, our copy, our headline, our subhead, and our body copy. And they correlate to the dominant photo. Now, once we get our dominant photo and our story on there, then you can start to fill the rest of the spread with photos, but you also wanna make sure you leave enough room for your captions, because every single photo that goes in the book needs a caption. Even the dominant, even the small ones, even the ones who you don't know who they are, you need to identify who those kids are in the book. And so we're going to put our secondary photo here in this space, the second largest space left. Then we're going to add photos all around the spread. And so you will have to figure out what looks best to you as far as like where those photos are going to go, but be sure you leave room for captions. And then we're going to add captions. So a couple of things about this. One, you'll notice that they are all one column wide. Captions can be whatever width you need them to, or whatever height you need them to be. So some captions are going to be really, really short and there might only be a couple of lines. Some captions you might need them to be extended a little bit longer and so they need to be you know, a little bit taller. But technically, you should have all your captions in your book or at the very least within a spread the exact same width. And so the easiest way to do this is to just make them all one um, column wide so you don't have to guess about what size they are. They're all just one column and that makes everything consistent. Um, I will say that that's really difficult to do, but that's why sketching this out on paper sometimes is so important because sometimes you get to a computer and you're looking at this blank page and you forget to leave room for captions and you just kind of throw them in where you can fit them and they look like an afterthought because they were an afterthought. And our brains can just process design a lot easier from like our brain to our pen and paper or our pencil than it can to a mouse who then has to translate how to put this onto a computer and vice versa. So if you can get layout sheets from your publisher that you can sketch on, it'll be a lot faster because you've already worked out all those problems. So if you start like putting pictures on your spread and you're like, oh my gosh, I forgot room for captions, you can erase a picture and you can move stuff around and you can adjust it a lot faster and easier and process those design elements before you get to a computer. 
So looking at this spread, you have everything you need in a very balanced way. You have five to seven photos, and in these photos, you are always looking for varied content. So you wanna make sure, what I mean by that is like, you are covering all grade levels. You have freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors, or you have sixth, seventh, eighth graders, whatever you have at your school. Then you wanna make sure you have all different ethnicities and demographics and boys and girls and like every variant that you can have as um, a t demographic at your school, you wanna make sure is represented. If the topic lends itself you know, to that, not every sport has both genders and stuff like that. But the other part is that you wanna make sure that you have different shots. So some are gonna be vertical, some are gonna be horizontal, some are gonna be more square. And you can see that from this layout like you can see that there's a vertical shot on the left and most are horizontal but then there's a square one on the left side too and your pictures need to represent that so this wouldn't be a great spread design for golf for instance because golf they're all vertical pictures almost of golfers swinging their golf club and hitting a ball um, but this might be really good for art or an academics page or something that you can take really great pictures of a lot a wide space like theater this might be a really great spread for and so you also have to think about your content and make sure your design is driven from that content and that it's not the other way around so then let's look at the how this you know little dev this little diagram turns into a spread that's completed we start to replace the text boxes with actual text we took away some of the colors as well. Um, and so we have a headline, we have an interesting subhead, we have some story, and then we have headlines, I mean captions. Also, we've removed our eyeline and our axis. Then let's remove our columns to start to see how it's gonna uh, look in the actual yearbook once it's printed. Much better, it's starting to look a lot cleaner already. Okay, now we're gonna replace those blue boxes with photos. Now keep in mind, these are just filler photos from Google but I like for staffs to do this as an example so they can start to practice translating a spread one from paper to the computer but then also from boxes and placeholders to actual content and then eventually to real content so here it is filled in with photos we also changed the headline the little mini headlines on the page to be in color we also changed the headline to be in a different color and I think that's it so far um, but as you can see, you've already started to incorporate some theme elements and very little, you have your fonts and you have a little bit of an introduction of your color. But you probably didn't even notice what it was different about this spread, but this spread is just slightly different and that's uh, the level of detail that it takes to make a spread go from pretty good to really good. And so let me go back, this spread um, is, it's good, it, it's pretty good but you want all of your text to be aligned to your gutter and so these text boxes on the left side they again they're in the right place they're in the right width they're they look fine but look at the difference when we bring when we go on the next spread and it moves those captions to be justified to the gutter see how much more complete that looks it adds a little bit we don't want our captions to be distracting and they're less distracting like this we want the focus and the emphasis to be on our photos and so this allows them to really just like fade into the background a little bit versus this I for some reason I feel like they're just kind of like jutting out into the white space right there and here they just kind of snuggle up into the space and it makes sense now if you really want to be advanced, you need to take your, this spread and also add what's called secondary coverage. This has a lot of terms in your book. Some people call it sidebars. Some people call it modules. Some people do their entire yearbook out of modules. It's totally up to you and what your staff wants to do. But remember our goal is that we want to get as many students in the book as we can, as much student opinion as we can, as, much, as many um, ideas and thoughts recorded as, the, as a yearbook is a history book. And so what I would do is re replace this photo on the far left of this coach, because also he's yelling, he's not doing anything super interesting, um, and replace it with something like this. And so this is gonna get four kids in the book, it's four headshots and head and quotes. Um, it adds student opinion, and it's a different perspective that you would have than just a picture from the sidelines. And so there's a lot of different things you can do for modules. Um, there's You can Google yearbook module ideas or yearbook sidebar ideas, and you can find tons of stuff about stuff that's behind the scenes, stuff that's interesting about a sport that you wouldn't know otherwise, unless you play it, that kind of stuff. 
people love to read that and that gets your student body interested in the publication as well. Okay, so this next one, we added a stroke around the photo. In yearbook terms, that we don't talk, uh, we don't use the word border or outline. We call it a stroke, and that goes around the photo. So that added a little bit of visual interest to the photo itself. It added a little bit more impact, even though it's already the dominant photo. It just kind of brought a little bit more attention to it. And we added a pull quote in between on that story, and that just brought it to be a little bit more interesting. Okay, so at this point, the spread is good. The spread looks awesome. It has design elements. It, it looks like it was designed with intention. Um, it's well balanced. It has secondary coverage. We have a really good dominant. We have a really good balance of sizes of photos. We have even good coverage. We have the crowd. We have the coach. We have the huddle. We have action shots. We have um, the national anthem before the game starts. Like This is overall a really, really good spread. But let's say that you want to just take it to that next level. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do to incorporate your design elements into your theme and really make your spreads cohesive throughout the whole book. And it's a lot of just little stuff that you can do. That attention to detail is really what's going to take your spread from great to even better. So the first thing is just moving this little picture on the right side over a little bit into the other one and adding a white stroke around it. So I'll go back real fast so you can see. So, oh, I'm in the way. Hold on. Let me move myself. There we go. Okay, so right here, this photo of this of this football player. Notice it's just um, it's hanging out where it belongs. And then for this next one, it's brought over just a little bit. It's brought down just a tiny bit. And then it has a white border around it. This makes it just kind of pop out from the edges. And this is a good example of what it means to break the rules once you know the rules. And so normally, we don't want photos um, overlapping. We want everything to have a consistent spacing and alignment. But this, it, it could be something related to your theme. So if your theme has something to, that talks about layers or um, puzzle pieces, like this visually it talks about what your theme is trying to say. And so we want to incorporate that kind of stuff once we know what the rules are and then we break them. So the next example takes your headline off of the top of the story and moves it onto the photo. Now you can't do this with every photo and you also can't do this with every font because you want to make sure that your legibility of your headline is of priority and most important. And so if your headline font isn't like bold enough, then you probably can't do this on photos. You also need to make sure that if you're whatever color you're putting it in, it you can still read it. And so if you have any sort of like for instance white sky in your photo and your text is already white, you're probably going to have trouble reading what your headline is. And so you need to be really careful about using this. It might be something that you use on your dividers only or your really dominant or your showstopper spreads. Um, what it's Whatever you wanna do is, is fine, but just make sure you prioritize that legibility it is, comes first and then you can get cutesy with it. Um, okay, in this next example, things got a little crazy and I have to explain it a little bit, but I use this for in Google Slides and so I couldn't quite design it how I wanted to, but um, if you have like slants as part of your design element, then there's a lot of things you can do. And this is again, just one example. But if you had this layout here and say this photo was slanted like this, um, you can take this story box right here and make it kind of like also line up against this photo, bring your headline over here. And so all your story also lines up against these slanted photos. It creates so much more visual impact and it would be so cool. Um, it wouldn't have this like random white space triangle here, but you have almost the exact same spread, but it instantly has a lot more visual impact because you have totally chopped this picture in half. And it also really got rid of a lot of dead space. If you look at the spread before, this part of the photo really doesn't have any context to it. So it's totally fine to chop off if you wanted to. And then down here, same thing, I would bring this photo out a little bit here and have it line up against this and fill in this space right here. And same with these captions, I would have them cuddle up into this corner and you know lean up against this uh, slant as well. And it would just be a super interesting spread to look at. So, 
hopefully that kind of helped to, for you to see how we take a spread from concept all the way through to completion. Um, in your downloads, there is a uh, spread checklist and it kind of gives you a really quick overview of everything you need to have on a spread. And so you can take this and you can print it out and you can attach it to your spread layouts and make sure that you go through this before you turn your spread in or before you turn in maybe a template that you're trying to decide that we're gonna use for the year. Make sure it has everything that you need and that you don't forget anything. Um, there are a bunch of things on here. We've talked about most of them, um, a headline, a subhead, make sure all of your, so your photos also have photo credit. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this. You can put them on the photo. You can put them in the, in the caption. Um, but you want to make sure that you're crediting everything, every single thing that goes in the book and identifying everybody that's in the book as well. Um, and so it also has stuff about alignment and like the nitty gritty things that might be hard to remember. Um, it has things about content, like making sure you spell check all your names and no text is trapped. You don't want any text in the middle. Notice we worked our way out from the middle and all of our captions were around the outside. Um, we talked about using various grid levels and genders and ethnicities and making sure you're including everyone on your page as well as just in your book. Um, and at the very end, did you do the best job you could on this page? Hopefully you check that off, but I always like to ask students and make sure, like, is this your best work? Don't turn it into me until it's your best work. There's a, a phrase I love to use and it's don't stop until you're proud. And I really believe in that. I think that there's a lot of things you can do with a yearbook spread. And at the same time, you could kind of keep tinkering with it forever and ever and ever. And obviously it gets to a point where you just have to turn it in. But don't stop until you're proud. Make sure that what you're turning in and what you're proposing for your templates and what you're doing at the beginning of the year to build out your theme packet and your style guide, like make sure that this is a yearbook that you are lo you love and you're proud of and don't just throw it together because you wanna get it done. So if you have any questions at all, my name is Katie and I am at, my email is katie at organizedadvisor.com. Um, it's just K-A-T-I-E at organizedadvisor with an E-R.com. Um, and if you have any questions at all, I'm happy to help you as you put together your book for next year. And I'm so excited to see them and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.